If there's anything that Insomniac Spider-Man for the PS4 should be praised for, it's its extremely accurate simulation of social media. It's got everything. It's got weird fandoms. It's got that guy who gets political in every post. It's got parents who don't understand how private messages work. But more importantly, being able to scroll through a social media feed really makes you feel like Spider-Man. Really makes you feel like Spider-Man. More than any other superhero, I've always identified with Spider-Man the most. Batman is a dark and brooding survivor of childhood trauma. Superman is an alien god from another planet. But Spider-Man at his core is just a skinny nerd. He has awkward text conversations with ex-girlfriends, tries to defuse bad situations with jokes no one gets, and is constantly flying through life by the seat of his pants, just barely being able to solve problems that he arguably created for himself in the first place. On some level, we're all Spider-Man, and that's probably why he has proven to be one of the most iconic and beloved superheroes of all time. So when I heard Insomniac was making a new Spider-Man game for the PS4, I was immediately interested. Insomniac is a good dev, and a lot of the early info that we got looked pretty promising. Well, now it's out, and after about 30 hours of gameplay, I can safely assure you that it's a great game. Now call your mom in to strap up your car seat, because this video is going to be a long ride. There is a ton of ground to cover to really give a fair analysis to this game, but I suppose we should talk about the best part first. The movement system in this game is incredible. Insomniac has achieved, without any shadow of a doubt, one of the greatest movement systems in video game history. This is the first time I've played a game since I was maybe 8 or 10 years old where I started it up and just ran around. Just swinging around for like an hour or two not even playing the actual game. It's exceedingly rare that something as simple as how your character moves from point A to point B to be this exciting. The only thing I can think of that even comes close is maybe the movement options that the player has in Mario Odyssey. This system is also really simple on paper. While swinging, you only really have about five different actions you can take, but the way the movements and animations all transition between each other make for a ridiculously streamlined and seamless experience. Why this game even included fast travel as an option completely baffles me. I didn't use the fast travel once in my entire playthrough, and oftentimes I would get so caught up in how fun it was just to fling Spider-Man around that I would go past whatever objective I was heading towards, and have to turn around and go back. As brilliant as this movement system is though, it does fall apart a little when it comes to fine movements. If you need to jump a short distance, things can get a little wonky, and the wall crawling isn't nearly as polished as the swinging is, but usually this is fine. It does lead to some awkward moments though. You will find people that will find something to complain about, and make some bullshit claim that the old PS2 Spider-Man or Ultimate Spider-Man had better swinging, but these people are impossible to please cunts. You could design the most complex web system of all time where you independently control all 10 of Spider-Man's fingers and these people would still find something to whine about. Okay, so the web slinging is 10 out of 10, but this wouldn't be a Spider-Man game without being able to give your enemies mild to moderate brain trauma, so how is the combat? Well, the lazy description would be that it's a lot like the Arkham games. This entire game, in all honesty, is heavily inspired by Arkham City, but there are a lot of differences here that deserve to be mentioned that I think make Spider-Man its own unique experience in terms of combat. I've seen a lot of people on Twitter say stuff like, After two hours of Spider-Man, the combat is shallow and boring and blah 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 blah. The, the problem with these people is they don't understand how progression works in a video game. Generally, in a game, the depth of a system will increase over time. Metroid is the perfect example of this. You need to actually progress through Metroid to unlock the rest of your abilities to be able to play the game to its full potential and complete it. Spider-Man is no different. Over the course of the game, you unlock more abilities and gadgets and upgrades that add a little bit more depth to the combat than you would initially think. You also gain some additional depth once you realize that you have two pathways to stop enemies. You can either punch them until they stop moving, or you can web them to a surface, and there are dozens of ways that you can mix these up and knock a guy in the air, web him, stick him to the ground. Web a guy, throw him into a wall. Web a guy, throw him in the air, stick him to the floor. Knock a guy over, web him. The list goes on and on, and part of the fun of the combat is figuring out all the goofy ways that you can achieve this. 
While you fight, you also have this resource called focus. This focus gauge fills up over time as you perform actions. During combat, you can fill up to three focus bars. You can spend one or two focus bars to do an instant takedown of an enemy, or you can spend one bar to heal. While you fight, you have this combo counter, which is reset if you wait too long before attacks or if you're damaged, and the higher your combo counter is, the more focus you get. This focus combo system is a really great way to incentivize actually mastering the combat system instead of just smashing buttons, and forcing players to choose between an instant takedown or a heal is also a great way to make choices matter in the heat of a fight. And if you're playing this game on the hardest difficulty, choosing to rattle off a couple of risky takedowns with low health instead of healing can definitely come back to bite you. You've also got quite a few options in the gadget department. If you're having trouble with a large group of enemies, toss a web bomb. Need this guy to stop moving? Hit him with a shock web. Want to go in quietly? Use these tripwire bombs. You can also stick these directly on enemies and stick two of them together, which is hilarious. And speaking of going in quietly, in a lot of combat situations in Spider-Man, you have the option to take on a stealth approach. Stealth takedowns are fun to look at, but the real interesting thing about stealth in Spider-Man is how fast-paced it is. And normally this web jump attack is just a gap closer used to get close to an enemy, and other than that has no special quality, but while stealth, it acts as a takedown. This move can be rapidly transitioned into from any of your movement abilities, and also rapidly chained together. This means that during certain stealth missions, you can pull off some really badass, flashy, and high-speed stealth combat, rather than the boring slog stealth can tend to be in a lot of games. The point is, while this combat system is very, very heavily influenced by the Arkham series, it does a good job of distinguishing itself as a unique experience, and offers players a lot of ways to decide how they want to tackle a fight. Saying this combat system is boring is a matter of preference, but saying that it's shallow or that there's not a lot going on here is a reflection of somebody not actually spending the time to play the game. The only weak spot in this combat system is boss fights, which is pretty unfortunate. A lot of them take a more cinematic approach, which I suppose is fine from a narrative perspective. And while the game does offer tons of opportunities to toss around hordes of goons, I would have liked to see some more interesting and creative bosses, especially since Spider-Man has so many great villains. I'm going to get into specifics real fast about some of the bosses, but there's going to be some mild spoilers. If you want to avoid that, skip ahead to here. One big issue I had with the boss fights in this game is once you get to the actual Sinister Six, two of the fights featured are two bosses at once, which seemed like a very rushed cop-out move. One fight is a Scorpion Rhino tag team, and the other, which is honestly probably the best fight in the game, is a Vulture Electro tag team. All four of these characters justify their own unique fight, and I think this was a big missed opportunity, and like I said, it feels very rushed. Especially Electro, because the chemistry between Spider-Man and Electro is awesome in this game. Uh, beast, you're up. No, Adrian, it's me, Spider-Man. What are you babbling about? Nobody ever gets my jokes. Our long feud ends tonight, insect. Spider-Man, I must break you. You got it. You got my joke. I'm so happy I can almost stop fighting. Almost. But this game isn't just about doing backflips and permanently damaging your fellow humans. I mean, it kind of is, but there's also some other stuff. Spider-Man has a pretty heavy collectathon element. In order to progress through all of your skills and various other upgrades, you need these tokens. As you can see, there are six different kinds. You generally earn these tokens by doing random shit around the city in between main storyline missions and side missions. And additionally, the police department has this massive, for sure not legal, dragnet spy network across the entire city. You can fix their radio towers in order to unlock more areas of the map and be able to track the various other objectives on your map or radar in order to get the tokens. At first, this system seems tedious and boring because some of the first tokens you start to unlock are the backpack tokens and the landmark tokens. These consist of literally just going up to one of these backpacks and pressing triangle, or taking a picture of a famous landmark. The problem with these is, since you can pinpoint where their location is and track them on the map, there's nothing fun about them. You aren't exploring or needing to actually put in effort to get these, they're just a bland point-and-click collectathon. This is even more annoying later on, when you see that there is a tracking system built into the game during these kidnap missions that would have been a much more interesting alternative than just grinding out backpacks by marking a spot on your map and going over to it. 
This radar system is so tedious in the early game that I thought it was going to end up being the biggest black spot on this game in terms of design, but fortunately the backpack tokens and the landmark tokens are the only ones that suffer from this problem. Crime tokens, base tokens, research tokens, and challenge tokens are also marked on your map, but they also require you to actually complete some sort of objective or challenge to earn them. This makes being able to track them on the map irrelevant, because when you get there, it isn't just a button press. You need to actually activate a couple of your brain cells and complete the objective. This is a wildly more effective design choice. If you're going to add something like the backpacks to your game, where the only goal is just to find where they are hidden, then finding where they are hidden needs to be the challenge, and not just a Google Maps simulator. And my final point about these backpacks is, when you collect one, you get an item, which gives you a little bit of world building or exposition. Two of these items are actually recipes. One is for dumplings, and the other one is for wheat cakes. I would be a complete failure as a content creator if I didn't also attempt to review these recipes. So here we go. The first recipe is for a wheat cake. It's basically just a cake with a little bit lower sugar in it. I made it in a bread pan. Uh, it would be pretty good as a breakfast food with maybe some butter or some jam. The second recipe is for Chinese dumplings, and these are extremely good. I ate like 25 of these and almost burned my kitchen down, splattering oil all over the place. Originally, my plan was to do kind of a goofy cooking show parody segment for this part of the video, but I really didn't have the time or the resources to make it good. So instead, I built you guys this giant Spider-Man in Minecraft. I hope that makes up for it. Both of these recipes are really good. I highly recommend both of them. Next, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about research tokens and challenge tokens, because they include some important aspects and aren't just combat challenges like most of the other ones. There are two ways to earn research tokens. You can either complete a side mission from one of these research centers set up by James Franco, or you can do this side mission that requires you to use your superhuman powers to their fullest extent by catching pigeons that fly around New York City. The Pigeon mission is pretty self-explanatory, but the research centers are a good time to talk about this game's science puzzles. During these research missions, when you're not seeing Spider-Man do things you've always wanted him to do, like vaccinate the fish, you're going to be doing a lot of these science puzzles. You'll also need to do them a lot during the main story missions. You've got two different varieties here. You've got these circuit board puzzles and these spectrography puzzles. Spect spectrography, spect spectrography, spectrography. These aren't hard. Some people hate them, some people are indifferent to them. You do have the option to skip them, and in general, they are being panned by most of the people reviewing this game. These puzzles aren't great, and they probably should have been polished more, or maybe even scrapped altogether, but I think I understand where the developers were coming from and why they included them. If you think back to the Arkham series, there were a lot of detective puzzles. That's because Batman, in addition to being Batman, is also the world's greatest detective. That's been a part of his character for a long time. So these puzzles show you there's more to Bruce Wayne than just cosplay and aggravated assault. Similarly, there's more to Peter Parker. He is Spider-Man, but he's also a genius scientist. I think the intention with these puzzles, even though they are a bit of a flop, was to try to get the audience to appreciate some of the characters' more overlooked but equally important traits. Next up, we have these challenge tokens. Challenges are subdivided into four categories, combat, stealth, bomb, and drone. Each one of these challenges also has a score, and depending on your score, you'll be rated bronze, silver, or gold. Combat missions are pretty simple, but the rest are a little more complicated. Remember all that shit I said about stealth in this game being surprisingly fast-paced? Well, that's showcased best during these stealth challenges. You need to move very quickly and efficiently if you want to get a gold score on these challenges, and the stealth system is really pushed to its highest possible speeds here. The bomb missions and the drone missions both achieve the same goal. They test your mastery of the movement system. During bomb missions, you need to find and destroy three bombs as quickly as possible, and during the drone missions, you need to follow a drone, collecting waypoints as quickly as possible. I got gold scores on all of these missions, and let me tell you, these are without any doubt the most difficult part of the game. If you want to get a gold on these challenges, your movements need to be ridiculously optimized, Anyone who claims this movement system is shallow or casualized needs to attempt these because I guarantee you they'll be firing their fucking controller out of a cannon after attempting a gold rating on literally any of these drone missions. Okay, so now you've got all these tokens, what do you do with them? Well, these tokens are what you use to progress through your skill tree, upgrade all your gadgets, and unlock new suits. The skill tree and the gadget upgrades are standard fare, but the suits are a little bit more interesting. 
First off, I don't know what it is about being able to unlock clothes in video games, but it's almost always awesome. Like, being able to put a cowboy hat on Mario, in theory, should add literally nothing to the game, but somehow, it adds everything. The suits in Spider-Man are the same thing. Unlocking suits actually does have a huge gameplay implication, other than just looking fresh, though. Unlocking suits also gives you an ability. Suit abilities are special moves used in combat that are really strong and have a long cooldown. Once you unlock a suit ability, you can use it with any suit you want. These suit abilities are pretty fun, sometimes you'll actually want to switch them out for strategy reasons, but a lot of them do seem pretty uninspired. Luckily, you never feel bad about a suit ability being garbage, because you're also unlocking the ability to look like a radical steampunk detective or to glow in the dark. Before I start attacking this game's weak points for massive damage, the last bit of praise I'm going to pile on is in regards to the story. This is a fucking great Spider-Man story. It has everything you could possibly want. It's got Spider-Man, it's got a Sinister Six, it's got another Spider-Man, it's got an MJ, it's got Norman Osborn and J. Jonah Jameson being comically massive assholes. It's got it all. But more important than what the story has is how it's delivered. This game actually manages to have some pretty good emotional moments, and the reason it's able to pull it off is twofold. One, it has a very cinematic musical score, which is a pretty quick and easy way to make people feel a feeling. And two, motion-captured facial expressions are very, very good in this game. We've reached a technologic point in video games where it's possible to have subtle emotion and facial expression depicted on characters that was previously only possible in film, and this is a truly great landmark for the medium. Even the more traditional methods of visual storytelling in this game are solid. Let's take a look at the opening cutscene. Here we have a camera panning through Peter Parker's shitty apartment. We see he's trying and failing to save money, and literally about to be evicted from his house. The context tells us that Peter is clearly an adult and has been Spider-Man for a while, and yet he's still living in more or less relative poverty. He could reveal himself to be Spider-Man at any point he wanted to, and surely rake in untold millions, but instead, he chooses to do good for the sake of doing good, and that tells you everything you need to know about his character in the first five seconds of the game. The story also has great delivery in the context of game design as well. For example, over the course of the game, you receive these phone calls that further the plot. These calls come from a bunch of different characters, and in most games, we would be forced to watch a cutscene, or the gameplay would be slowed down while this exposition was happening, but here you maintain full movement and combat capabilities while you're getting the exposition. In fact, this game is so well polished that every voice line from Peter was actually recorded twice, once for a resting voice and once for an exerted voice. You can see an example of what I mean in this Twitter video that I'll link in the description. I was so impressed by this tweet that I bookmarked it like a 60 year old lady so that I'd remember to put it in the video. The best use of these calls is probably for Dr. Octavius' character arc. Over the course of the game, he grows more and more bitter and vengeful, and it's done in a brilliantly subtle way over the course of several calls. But it's beginning to dawn on me just how powerful and insidious the forces arrayed against true visionaries are. I promise you, though, it won't be long. Success will come, whatever it takes. In conclusion, the story is great, and the end will for sure make you cry. I mean, it didn't make me cry because I'm a big strong man who watches Tucker Carlson, but you guys will for sure cry. Okay, so to recap, we have excellent movement, great combat, a great story, and generally solid design choices. So now the question is, what, if anything, went wrong? Well, there are some boring side missions, the puzzles were a little underwhelming, and sometimes some of the city events, like crimes, can get pretty repetitive, but all of that pales in comparison to this game's largest and most glaring flaw. For some sections of the game, rather than playing as Peter Parker and or Spider-Man, you'll be playing as either MJ or Miles Morales in various stealth missions. These missions are hot garbage. Imagine this, one minute you're swinging around New York City, uppercutting street thugs into low orbit, and then you get to the next main mission, excited for what comes next, and... The most frustrating thing about these missions is even though they're a tedious drag, they also offer some good exposition. But you'll find yourself just wishing that you were watching a cutscene or listening to some audio instead of struggling through a terrible stealth section. 
the only time one of these missions manages to at least be passable is the Grand Central level, where you're moving around as MJ, marking enemies for Spider-Man to take down. But you know what would make this more fun? Literally just playing as Spider-Man like you have been for the rest of the game. This isn't to say that sections where we play as Miles or MJ aren't an inherently bad idea, they just seem to be polished more and made into something a little bit more unique or interesting. The Grand Central level, I think, should have been the blueprint for these missions. The idea of playing as a normal human that is basically Spider-Man's eyes on the ground directing his actions to make sure an operation goes smoothly is pretty cool, and it would allow for that classic superhero story trope where normal people get to be a hero too. Because the entire point of a masked hero is that it could be anyone. I really hope this game's inevitable sequel really expands on these missions in some way, because they're pretty much unanimously agreed upon as being this game's weakest link. So that's more or less Spider-Man. It's a fantastic, well-polished game with very few flaws, and the flaws it does have won't ruin your experience. If you own a PS4 and you can afford to drop $60 on a AAA game, you should absolutely pick this up. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.